passage. But we are in John chapter 20. I'm going to give to you a quote from a man by the name of Dr. Ian Hutchison. He says this, As a professor of nuclear science and engineering at MIT, I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. He continues on and he says, and so do dozens of my colleagues there at MIT. And then he writes, how can this be? And he lays out three hypotheses that in an article that uh, he wrote, and by the way, that'll be up on the church Facebook page later this afternoon. And those three hy- hypotheses are something like this, that either A, he believes in kind of a, a spiritual resurrection, where that was just intended to propagate Jesus' ethical teachings, or that he literally physically or believes in a literal physical uh, death and resurrection of Jesus. Or maybe he was brainwashed as a child, is what he goes on to say. And he, and he grew up in a religious home. And he clarifies, he did not grow up in a religious home. He did not grow up in a Christian home. But as a college student at Oxford, he placed his faith and trust in Jesus of Nazareth. And believes in the physical death burial, and resurrection, he continues and he says this, we, my Christian colleagues at MIT and millions of other scientists worldwide, really believe in the bodily resurrection of the first century Jew known as Jesus of Nazareth. He then explains, science offers natural explanations of natural events. It has no power or need to assert that only natural events Uh, that only natural events happens, that is contrary to popular opinion, science is not our only means for accessing truth. In the case of Jesus' resurrection, he says we consider historical evidence, and the evidence for the resurrection is as good as any event in ancient history. And so this morning, I want us to consider the Bible's evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. You're in John chapter 20, I'm going to pray, and then we'll begin. Now, Father, we pray that you would use this time, Lord, for the person who is skeptical in here, for the individual who is doubting, maybe even for a Christian who is really wrestling with the ramifications or the belief. Maybe uh, someone who has grown up in a Christian home really is questioning whether or not they should believe this. And so I pray that by the Spirit of God, wherever we may find ourselves on the spectrum of belief, on this continuum, your Spirit would give us understanding and grace to believe the Word of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In John 20, look at the very last two verses of John 20. Verses 30 and 31, it reads this way. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John chapter 20 gives us four, evid- or four vignettes, four short stories of what is going, of, of, of uh, the disciples of Jesus. We, we start off, first of all, with Peter and John. And then we move into the story of Mary Magdalene. And then we, can, we go into the disciples and we end up with Thomas, whom we call Doubting Thomas. These four stories that are stacked up one on top of each other, they're not intended for you to walk into the John 20 and say, well, you know, I wonder if I'm a little bit like Mary. Or, you know, I, I kind of think I'm like Peter and I would have just kind of ran right into that tomb and tried to figure out all those tomb those grave clothes. Or nor is it meant for you to say, well, you know, I'm the doubting Thomas of my family. That's not the intent and purpose of John chapter 20, although certainly we have those thoughts. Rather, at the end of each one of these four stories, and I'll show them to you as we go along, at the end of these four stories, there is what I would call kind of a divine opinion. There's a voice, there's a, there's a voice from above that speaks into the story and says, this is how I want you to consider this story right here. A divine comment, if you will, that kind of guides our minds and thoughts of Jesus' resurrection. So here's the first one. It's about Peter and John. 
And it is simply this, that the resurrection confirms the scriptures. Uh, I'm in John chapter 20. I'm going to start all the way back in verse 1. Here we go. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark, and he saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran, and she went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. That would be the, uh, John, the author of the book. And he said, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. A Jewish custom expected mourners to mourn for three solid days. And the reason for that was this, is that they, they expected the, the spirit, so to speak, of the deceased individual to kind of be hovering in, the, in, the, in and around the grave. But as the body began to decay, they thought that the spirit of that deceased individual would walk away or would go away. Now, because this is Jewish uh, customs, remember, they were not allowed to travel far on the Sabbath day. And in, in Jewish custom, the Sabbath day would have been the day before Jesus rose on a Sunday. And so when Mary has to run and go get Peter and John, they're not too far away wherever they are. And so that is why Peter and John actually kind of race each other and why they have the ability to race each other for at least a short distance. Mary approaches the tomb around 3 to 6 a.m. The Bible says it's the first watch of the morning. It's somewhere between that 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. And when she comes up to the tomb, she's startled. And she's startled because of what you see on the screens behind me, the, the stone has been rolled away. Now, that's interesting for this reason, because not just any person could roll a stone away. It would take, at a minimum, two Roman soldiers to push that stone, because that heavy-weighted stone actually didn't just, just, just roll across. It actually rolled down into a, a crevice of some kind, so it was locked in. So immediately, Mary begins to think, the Romans have stolen Jesus' body. Maybe to desecrate it. Maybe some grave robbers have come to strip the tomb of any wealth, including the body itself. So Mary goes and she gets Peter and John. John is the younger of the two. That's why the text says that he was able to outrace Peter to the, to the tomb. But Peter, being older, He's a little bit more impulsive, if you know anything about Peter, a little bit more impetuous. And he enters first, and what they find is this. They are shocked. But they are shocked over what they find, but it's not exactly what you would anticipate them being shocked about. Look at verse 4. I'll show you. Again, if you have a Bible in front of you, it's page 906, uh, John chapter 20, verse 4. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter. That would have been John, who's younger. And he reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there. Uh, but he did not go in. But then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there. And the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. And he saw and believed. I say this is not what you were anticipating or not what you were expecting. For this reason, because it, the way the, the underlying Greek language is written there, it's, it's this, is that when they peered into the tomb, they literally saw the clothes were not disheveled and thrown off to the side. Right? That literally those tomb clothes were still wound. As if the body went right through the grave clothes. And the only thing that the body did not go through was the head cloth. That was folded up and placed off to the side. Teaching us this, these were, this was not a grave robbing. These were not Roman soldiers attempting to kind of play with those disciples' minds and desecrate the body of Jesus. It's that the text is hinting to us that something supernatural has gone on. But the point isn't, you know, would you have believed like Peter did or like John did when you, when you entered the tomb? That's not the point. Here's the divine commentary. Look at verse 9. It is this. Verse 8 says, the other disciple went in, he saw and believed. Verse 9. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture 
that he must rise from the dead. That's the divine commentary. That's what we're intended to think of when we see this first vignette of Peter and John is, do you believe the scriptures? Do you believe that this is what the Bible is is saying? The argument is this, is that they did not understand the prophecy of Jesus, or the Bible's prophecy about the Messiah being resurrected from the grave, nor did they believe Jesus' teachings. You know, it's fair to say, and it's fair to struggle, I think, that if that one reason, if you're here, that you may struggle with believing is you simply don't know what the Bible is fully teaching. I, I, I'm not saying that you're ignorant. I'm just simply saying this, is that you have kind of the, the high, the, the peaks of the Bible's teaching, and one peak is the resurrection of Jesus. But what you don't have is you don't have the full mountain range that the Bible lays out. That's what, that's what that first comment is intended to do for us, is to say, hey, listen, there's more that the Scripture is trying to teach us and how that it, it culminates and climaxes in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Believe it, the Scriptures have taught it. In fact, I would argue this way, that you would need to learn not just a verse or two, but really how all of the Bible finds its fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's divine comment one, that which is this, that the scriptures teach the resurrection. Here's the second vignette. And that is about Mary. And what Mary is going to teach us is not something about her and her life. Well, we know a little bit about her life, but it is this, is that the resurrection changes our relationships. Let me show you this. Look at verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at his feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I, I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Uh, Whom are you seeking? Now, supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Mary's mascara was all over the place that morning. See, there was too much, too much tears going on. And she couldn't, she couldn't figure out who exactly she was talking to. But when she heard the voice of her Savior say her name, now she knew. She recognized her Savior's voice. The Bible says this, my sheep hear my voice. They know me. And they follow me. Now, whether you're a a Bible reader or you're a, a secular author, everyone considers this to be one of the most touching stories in all of literature, for sure in the Bible, but all of literature, secular included. And it's touching for this reason because Jesus is not far off and distant. Rather, he knows those who are his. And like Mary, he calls us by name. The Bible teaches this, that he knows the number of hairs that are on your head. He knows the anxiety that kept you up last night. He knows the fears that bring tears to your eyes. And like Mary, I want to say this, he's calling your name, not audibly, but by the Spirit of God, he is drawing you to Jesus. In fact, some of you, maybe all of a sudden, the Jesus of Christianity has become more and more fascinating to you. You really can't explain why. Why this sudden urge of interest in religion, it appears to be, to you? I would say this, it's because Jesus is calling your name. And days gone by, I maybe 
For some in here in days gone by, the name of Jesus or God was nothing more than a way to curse or damn others. You know what our prayer for you has been? Our prayer for you is that the name that maybe you've used to curse or that we have all at some point maybe in our lives used to curse or damn others, that that name would be now precious to you. In fact, I can say it this way. If you're visiting with us or maybe you've been with us for a good while, but you don't know Jesus, did you know that there are people in this room, this is the first Easter in which they know Jesus? That they've been, to use Bible lingo now, to use insider terminology, they've been born again, they've placed their faith in Christ. Now, Jesus then says something that's really kind of odd to Mary. He says to her, look at verse 17, Jesus says to her, do not cling to me, don't touch me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Jesus tells Mary, don't, don't stop clinging to me. Not because Jesus liked his personal space, that's not it. There's not something kind of ooky spooky about a, a resurrected body. That, that's not even the intent and purpose behind it. It's more of this. Stop clinging to me and go, go tell the, the, the other disciples what I just told you, that I'm about to go to my father and your father, uh, to my God and your God. Go tell them that. And so Mary goes, just do that. And here's the divine comment that we're supposed to think. Look at the last half of verse 17. It is this, go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. The resurrection fundamentally changes one's relationship to God. That's the divine comment, that when Jesus rose from the grave, that something fundamentally altered a person's relationship to God if they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, the resurrection ensures that the privileges that Jesus had as God's son actually aren't just kept between Jesus and the Father, but are extended to people who believe on Jesus. That is what Jesus is saying here. That, no, that folks, no longer is God simply a judge, but now he is a good father. That, that no longer is he inaccessible, that the holy ground of God the Father is no longer off limits. But because of Christ's death and resurrection, the Father is now accessible through Christ. You see, you get this implicitly in the text. Friend, your access to God is not based upon your goodness or your deeds. It's not your baptism. It's, it's nothing that you can do. It's it's. I put it this way, it's not your actions, it's Christ's act. It's not your doing, it's what Christ did. It's not your working, but Christ's work. This is what Jesus is intending for us to understand and realize that by the resurrection, uh, those who believe on Jesus, their relationship to the Father now is different. That there is a fatherly relationship. Each scene is affirming the resurrection. That's a given. But what it's doing is it's challenging a weakness or a thought process that we have in our own lives. Here's the third one. So we went from Peter and John to Mary. And now we're going to go to the disciples. All the disciples with the exception of one, Thomas. Yeah. It's Sunday morning evening now. All of the disciples but Thomas are present. Why are they gathered together? I, maybe they're fearful. Maybe they're nervous that, well, they went after Jesus. Maybe we're the, they're going to come after us next. Maybe that's why they're going after him. And while they are there, just like Jesus passed through those grave clothes, he enters into the room where those disciples are. And no doubt, they're startled and a little bit freaked out, like you and I would too, would be as well when someone walks into the room, un unannounced and unexpected. Look at verse 19 of John chapter 20. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, 
The doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Now, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side to, to, to say, Hey, this is, this is really me. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord, that they weren't seeing a ghost, that it wasn't some kind of an apparition, that they were really able to see and touch and feel this is the resurrected Jesus. And if there's any clarification or any kind of doubt in your mind, you can even read later on in John chapter 21, where it says that Jesus actually ate fish and bread so that he physically arose. But what's interesting here is this, is that Jesus says to them, peace. Shalom. He says peace to them. Now, this is the Resurrection Sunday, right? What type of peace would Jesus or could Jesus offer on Resurrection Sunday? What was the very last thing that he said on the cross in John chapter 19? In John chapter 19, verse 30, with his arms stretched out on the cross, he said in, he, in, 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 uh, in Hebrew, he said, to Tetelestai, or Greek actually, to Tetelestai, which means this, it is finished. And so when Jesus says, peace be unto you, he's saying this on the Resurrection Sunday. Here's your peace. It, my work, is accomplished. It's finished. Peace. That is what he is getting. So it's, it's not, in fact, it's not by accident. That every time you open up one of the New Testament and you open up specifically one of the, those epistles, those books, that one of the authors begins this way. Grace and peace to you. What, what were those authors picking up on? It wasn't just a, hey, how you doing? Kind of a, a, a Jewish way to say, good morning, how are you? Right? That's not how they did it. It was a Christian way of reminding believing people that Christ's peace has been applied to their life. How? Through the tetelestai, through the it is finished on the cross. Christian, this knowledge, this fact-based understanding of the gospel then is not intended to stay with you and it's not intended to stay with me. Look at verse 21. What does Jesus say to them in that upper room? He says this, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. He says it a second time. Here it is, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. I want you to notice the tenses. I know this isn't grammar class. Did you notice the tenses of those verbs? As the Father has sent me. And the idea is this, is that this action that happened in time past is going to continue to have ongoing results into the future. Jesus does not see this as two missions. Like, I got a mission, and then you've got a mission over here. That's, it's not two missions going on here. It's this, that the mission that he extended to the disciples and to those of us who are believing on him is that we are carriers, we are connectors, and continue this mission of Christ. And so the divine comment for us to understand is this. It's not, you know, if you would have been in the upper room, would you have been scared when Jesus said, hey, look at my hands, look at my side? No, 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 no. The divine comment is this, that the resurrection continues the commission. The resurrection continues the mission. That is, this senseness that, that God sent his son for extends to you and to I, to me. It extends to every person who believes on Jesus that this mission is not just for a select few, like, you know, those really religious types who are just really serious, like, oh, man, that's really a lot of dedication. No, that's not. It extends to anyone who's a believer on Jesus. So, Christian, how would you extend this? Well, are you in a painting class on a Thursday evening? Do you coach your kids' soccer team? Do you enjoy watching a ball game at Buffalo Wild Wings with a coworker every now and then? Are you in a running club on Saturday morning? Do you enjoy going to the gun range and shooting guns? Do you like to, old, to restore old cars? Maybe some of you are in a, a local book club. 
You get together once a week or once a month. Maybe your children are young. So every now and then you just got to get out of the house and go to the park so that the kids get some exercise. Maybe it's you're going to the pool this summer. Folks, you see that the commission or the sentness is not about necessarily you even leaving the physical territory of Cyprus or the physical territory of Texas. It certainly includes that. But this sentence, this mission that God has called us to is, as you are doing life, whatever it may be doing, whatever you may be doing, talk about Jesus. Point, point people to Jesus and the resurrection. Point people that way to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what God is calling us to. Now, this resurrection story isn't just so that you believe, right? But it's that you understand the implications, the applications of the resurrection. The scriptures are accurate that a a believer's relationship to the Father is fundamentally changed and the mission does not end when Jesus returns, but it continues with one more story. And it is this. It's the one of Thomas who we all love, because we all see ourselves a little bit in Thomas's story. We all see ourselves in some way as maybe doubting and not having the faith that maybe we should. And so I want to conclude that way, and that is Thomas, the resurrection challenges our faith. I read this quote this past week by I believe is a pastor named John Irvin. He, He said this, anyone can be sentimental about Christ's birth. Anyone can feel like a Christian at Christmas, but Easter is the main event. If you don't believe in the resurrection, you are not a believer. I say amen to that. Thomas has heard now that Jesus has come to the disciples, his friends, and his response is, well, unless I see the hand, uh, his hands and the, the mark of the nails in his hands. And unless I place my, my fingers into the marks of the nails and place my hands into his side, I will never believe. That was Thomas's response. Now it's eight days later. So it's a, I guess a Monday night now or Monday is when we're about what, what we're about to read. Look at verse 26. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, here it is again, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. It's never stated. Did Thomas actually do it? It's kind of a grotesque imagery and, and thought process here. Did, did Th- Thomas actually do that? I, I don't know. But here's what I do know. That Thomas the doubter became Thomas the believer. How do you know that Thomas the doubter became Thomas the believer? Because Thomas gives to us one of the clearest, most profound expressions of the deity of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 28 where Thomas says this. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Thomas' confession is an act of worship. Historians think that this may have been a phrase actually used in the Roman Empire. That you would say of the Caesar, Caesar is Lord, Caesar is God. And so maybe... Thomas is kind of ripping off a Roman expression and saying, oh, my Lord, my God. And then Jesus closes with an invitation. Look at this in verse 29. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? And he extends this invitation to us in 2019. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, these signs 
Grace life, they're written so that you may believe. What are you supposed to believe? That Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. The only thing this Christian church has to offer is this. We offer eternal life. Peter would say this, gold and silver have I none, but such as I offer to you, I offer in the name of Jesus Christ. The only thing that we have to offer is the good news that Jesus Christ died, not just for somebody's sins, not just for somebody else's sins. He didn't just die for my sins, he died for your sins. This is what we have to offer. And you say, what should be my response? Your response is this, is to believe on Jesus the offer of the gospel of Christ, the gospel means good news, the offer of the gospel of Christ is to take your sin. But in exchange, you get Jesus' righteousness. It was last Sunday. We had our grand opening here at the church. It was last Sunday after the service that one of our first-time guests talked to me afterwards and they trusted Jesus to save them from their sins. They met Jesus, the resurrection, and the life. You see, John 20 is not about looking in here and finding yourself and saying, well, you know, I'm a lot like Peter, I'm like John, or I'm like Mary, or, or the disciples, or Thomas. That's not what it's about. But it is about reckoning with the resurrected Jesus. And I want to give you that opportunity this morning as well for everybody in this room. And you may be a skeptic. You may need to have a lot more questions answered, and that's okay. Or like Mary, you may feel and sense that your name is being called. It's not something you're used to, not something you emotion that you recognize. I would say this to you, that today is the day to be saved. In just a moment, I'll give you an opportunity, if you would like, to respond to Jesus' work on the cross. Uh, everybody's heads will be bowed and eyes will be closed, but if you'd like for someone to pray with you, there will be individuals here at the aisles, and men and women, English-speaking and Spanish-speaking. If you'd like to follow Jesus, so I want to make Jesus my Lord and my God, then we want to give you the same opportunity that Thomas had, and Mary, and Peter, and John, and the disciples, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I heard a story this past week. It was a Christian uh, from a South African village. He said this, he said, when an unbeliever is dying in my village, the witch doctors will put in his hand a dead bone as a passport into the world beyond. This Christian brother said this, but we do not grasp a dead bone as we pass through the veil. We grasp the hand of the living Lord. And friend, that is the hand that we offer to you today through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ who was sent by his Father to rescue, to reconcile people like me, people like you. Let's close the word of prayer.